Washington. And unfortunately, uh, there was a story on black Baltimore City. And as you all know, I spent a lot of time in Baltimore City. I love Baltimore City. I get a lot of respect and support in Baltimore City. Well, the CNN uh, story talked about how one of our beautiful black sisters of, uh, I believe, six or seven children was just murdered in cold blood. And we want to send condolences to her. And we want to send condolences to her family. It's absolutely unacceptable to take the life of any African, and especially a mother. Black women have a very special place in African culture. They are the divine portals through which Supreme Consciousness Olodumare sends and reincarnates ancestors back into human flesh and form. So I want to send a special condolence out to that family, special condolence out to those children. If there's any way Dr. Umar Johnson can be of any support or help or assistance in any way whatsoever to the queen in Baltimore who just lost her life, I believe yesterday or the day before, a mother of six or more children. If I can help, please let me know. But also in Chicago, another city that is a very big Dr. Umar Johnson supportive city. Uh, many of you know that my rise within the black consciousness was catapulted from Chicago, Illinois. So Chicago holds a very special, special place in my heart. And here's what I want to say. And first, let me say happy Father's Day to all the black fathers. Let me say happy Father's Day to all the black fathers out there. I want to commend all the black fathers for doing a good job being fathers. And even to you brothers who don't have biological children of your own, I want to commend you for doing a good job by being a father or father figure to other children, young boys and young girls for whom you may not necessarily be the biological parent. So definitely happy Black Father's Day. Happy Black Father's Day to all the fathers out there. Okay, and this message today that I'm delivering right now on Black America begging the President of the United States to come in and save them from each other. Black America is begging the President of the United States, Donald Trump, to come in to the inner city and save us from ourselves. Brothers and sisters, that is the worst thing we can do. That is the worst thing we can do. Because if you're begging for presidential intervention, the only thing Donald Trump is going to send to you and his attorney general has already said he's going to send it to you. And that is nothing more than more police. He's going to send you more police. Why does black America need more police? Why are you begging the president of the United States to send you more white vigilantes, more racist white vigilantes to come into the black community? Why are we asking for that? Why are we asking for that? I mean, we've been dealing with the United States government, okay, and the 13 colonies prior to for 398 years. We've been dealing with this government and the colonies that preceded, preceded it for 398 years. After 398 years, why is, why is black America begging the president of these United States to come into our neighborhood and save us from ourselves? Are you not aware that the government of the United States created the black on black crime reality. Are you aware that the president of these United States created the black on black crime reality? Shout out to all the brothers and sisters who came out yesterday and packed the house in Seattle, Washington yesterday. I didn't expect to see that many Africans out in Seattle. And I just wanna say thank you. Brothers and sisters from Portland were there. Brothers and sisters came up from Texas, they came up, several brothers and sisters from Arizona. So I wanna say thank you to everyone who came out to show Dr. Umar Johnson love. Next stop is the Breakfast Club interview. I will be interviewed for part three. Charlemagne the God, DJ Envy, Angela Yee, Wednesday, June the 21st. The Prince of Pan-Africanism will be back on Power 105 with the Breakfast Club. And then I will be in Washington, D.C. this Saturday. Washington, D.C. this Saturday to keynote the Power Talk celebration. 
My good brother David Banner is keynoting on Friday. The Prince of Pan-Africanism is keynoting on Saturday. And then Brooklyn, 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 New York City, Manhattan, Queens, Harlem, Staten Island. It's time to stand up. The Prince of Pan-Africanism will be in Brooklyn Friday, June 30th. Everyone who bought tickets to the June 2nd event that had to be canceled because my security went missing on me. You don't have to worry. We got new security. Everything will be fine. Brooklyn, New York City, Friday, June 30th. The Prince of Pan-Africanism will be up in the building. So let me get back to my message. And I'm a little hoarse from last night's lecture. I'm a little hoarse and from the Detroit training. And from Minneapolis, I'm a little hoarse. But anyhow, brothers and sisters, the President of the United States, not Donald Trump per se, but that office and this government created the black on black crime catastrophe that we have. Let me explain to you how they created black on black homicide in 10 easy steps. First of all, let us keep in mind that you don't have a black on black male fratricide problem. You don't have a black on black female fratricide. Uh, uh, that wouldn't be fratricide. That would be, what do they call it? When women kill women. That's not fratricide. That's uh, sororicide or whatever. I got to find that word. But you don't get black on black crime as an issue until the 1960s, 1970s. Really, it was the 70s. The 70s was the evolution of black gang warring. 70s was the evolution of black on black crime. I'm not saying we didn't have crime before the 70s. I'm saying that crime was put on steroids beginning in the 70s. And I'm going to explain to you how this all happened. First of all, fratricide traditionally is not a black America issue. Fratricide traditionally is a Southern European immigrant situation. When you study fratricide, ethnic crime, in America, you find that the Italians, the Irish, and the European Jews led the way when it came to ethnically induced fratricide. I'm going to repeat, the Italians, the Irish, and the European Jews were the original creators and inventors of ethnic induced crime. The Jews killed each other in the streets. The Irish killed each other in the streets. The Italians killed each other in the streets of America. And they killed each other in the streets of America, not because they were born to be criminals. I don't believe that for one minute. Not because they were born to be criminals. I don't believe that in one minute. But they killed each other because America shut out Southern European immigrants from realizing the American dream. They were not allowed to get jobs. They were not given decent housing. Okay, they were relegated to the poorest section of American ghettos. In fact, the word ghetto is a Jewish word. It is not an American word, it is a Jewish word, which speaks to how the Jews were some of the most impoverished people in early America, even during the transatlantic slave trade. Okay, they were not worse than us. No one suffered the way African people suffered but they were underdeveloped as a people. They were castrated by the American government because they were not considered to be white folks, okay? They were poor white trash. Poor white trash was created and invented and maintained by the American government. And I'm not disrespecting poor white America. I'm simply saying that poor white trash was the United States government invention. And why did the United States government create an entire system based off of poor white trash. The reason they created poor white trash in America is because rich white capitalism, rich white capitalism needed poor white trash to build their empires upon. If you study all the great giants of capital in American history, whether you look at the Rockefellers, whether you look at the Morgans, whether you look at the Vanderbilts, you look at any of America's leading families, and you will find that many of them 
built their empires on the backs of poor people. And the only way that they were able to build their empire on the backs of poor people is by keeping a large segment of America's white people poor, disenfranchised, homeless, and destitute. Remember, capitalism cannot survive. Capitalism cannot survive without a very large, exploitable source of cheap labor. I'm going to say it again. Capitalism cannot survive without a very large, cheap, and readily available source of cheap labor. Up until the end of slavery, poor white people, poor white trash, were that source of free labor for American capital. Okay? And what needs to be understood, poor white trash predates black poverty. Remember, African people were enslaved from 1619 to 1865, 243 years. We were enslaved, not even considered to be people. And because we were not even considered to be people, it was poor white trash who were actually considered the lowest of the low. They were the least valued people in the American social order. They were the very bottom. Okay. We were the very bottom in all actuality. But remember, we were not considered human beings yet. Black people were not even considered living human beings. Okay. And so, America was built off of poor white trash. You need to understand this. So, because they were not given jobs, they were not given adequate health care, decent housing, education, guess what? They fought each other in the streets. They killed each other in the streets. They got drunk. They beat their women. They started gangs and they killed each other. They did this by the hundreds and they did this by the thousands. And one of the reasons that the American government decided to intervene on the white on white crime, one of the reasons the American government decided to intervene on white on white crime is because it began to drive population numbers down. It began to drive population numbers down. In other words, if we keep on letting white men kill white men, we're going to begin to lose our numbers in this country. We need white men for World War I. We need white men for World War II. We can't afford to have them killing each other on the inner city streets of America. So America decided that we're going to have to do something to stop the white on white violence. See, they never talk about this when they talk about Baltimore. They never talk about this when they talk about Chicago. They never bring this up when they talk about the murders in New York City and in Houston and Los Angeles. They go right to the black on black crime without talking about the fact that it was white on white crime. It was white on white violence and fratricide that paved the way for black on black crime. So how did this happen? This happened because in 1940, in 1940, in 1940, okay, I would love to come back on WVON. Anyone with a radio show who wants to interview the most requested black scholar in the world, undisputed, all you have to do is send me a text message Y'all know my number. It's public. 215-989-9858. 215-989-9858. Ladies, it ain't that type of party. Business only. Okay? And I don't date sisters unless they natural. I don't date sisters unless they natural. So if you're not nappy, you can holler. But anyway, getting back to the point... If you would like to interview the prince, text me. You can also email me, Dr. Umar Johnson at yahoo.com. If you want to invite me to speak, there is a fee. I don't do free lectures anymore.
because number one, y'all take advantage of it. But more importantly, I need funding for many of my different programs. So if you want to invite me to speak, Dr. Umar Speaks at Yahoo.com. Dr. Umar Speaks at Yahoo.com. When is WVON? Taste of WVON. You know I love Chicago. I got to let me know. When is the Detroit Festival? I need to know. If there's any festivals going on in your city, text me. I'm going to be off for the next couple weeks, July. We don't go to Africa until July 27th. So the Prince of Pan-Africanism is basically free from July 1st to July 27th. I repeat, the Prince of Pan-Africanism is basically free from July 1st to July 27th. So if you want to invite me to a lecture, okay, that's the perfect time to do it. July 21st, July 27th. Get your invitations in because I'm already getting swamped with requests. But if y'all having a summer jam, summer vest, I love to just come somewhere and chill. I don't always want to teach. I don't always want to train. I don't always want to raise the consciousness. Of course, I love that more than anything else. But sometimes the Prince of Pan-Africanism just wants to lay back, chill, socialize with the brothers. You know what I mean? Socialize with the queens. Take pictures with the youth. So if there's anything going on in your city, let me know. Doc, we got a Black American Fest. Doc, we got a Juneteenth Fest. Doc, we got a Black Family Cookout. If there's something going on in your town, let me know. Okay? I'll book a flight, get my hotel, and I will come chill. Sometimes I just like to chill. But if you want me to speak, then there's a fee for that because I have credentials. Okay? I'm not a dusty old tepper. I have degrees, and you will pay for me to come and speak. Now, getting back to how white on white crime became black on black crime. Send an email, Mike Fernandez. Dr. Umar speaks at yahoo.com. D R U M A R speaks. D R U M A R speaks at yahoo.com. Anyhow, America couldn't afford to be losing so many white folks, white men, to white on white crime, violence and drunkenness. But let's do the psychology. Let's do the psychology. Why were so many white men killing white men? Because unemployment causes depression. Not being able to provide for your family causes depression. That depression induces drug use. That depression induces alcoholism. That depression can trigger domestic abuse, low self-esteem. It, in, it engenders anger, passion, resentment, disappointment, rage, hostility. White men killed each other for the same reason black men kill each other. White men killed each other for the same reason black men killed each other and that was because they were angry at the fact that they were not allowed to be men they were angry at the fact that they were not allowed to be men okay gangs of new york if you saw the movie gangs of new york shout out to roderick jones you're absolutely correct gangs of new york is an excellent movie that shows you how white gangs ran the 13 colonies Poor white males, the leaders of the poor white trash community, killed each other and fought for what little illegal drug and alcohol trade they could possibly muster. Okay? Everything black men do today, white men did it 70 years ago. Everything black men do today, white men did 70 years ago. Okay? They were the original drug dealers. They were the original killers. They were the original uh, illegal racket runners. But in 1940, America decided in 1940 that they were going to upgrade Irish, Jews, and Italians to white status. Up until 1940, if you were Irish, Jewish, or Italian, you were not considered white. You had to become white. You had to become white. So in 1940, okay, World War II, World War II begins to take shape. World War II. So America said, 
shit. How are we going to get these poor white men who we ain't never gave nothing to? How are we going to induce them to fight in a war for a country that won't even give them a decent job or a decent meal? So they said, listen, in order for us to get these Jews, Italians and Irish to fight for America in World War II, we're going to have to throw them a couple crumbs from the American dream. So they said, OK, what we're going to do is we're going to give the Irish the police department. And they started hiring Irish. They started hiring white racist Irish men to come and police the black community. And then they gave the Italians the fire department. They started hiring white racist Italians to work in the fire departments in the black community. If you remember, the black community had to fight for a very long time to integrate the police force. And the black community had to fight for a very long time to integrate the fire department because America gave the Italians a monopoly on the black fire departments and America gave the Irish a monopoly on the uh, police departments in the black community. And then they gave the European Jews the civil service jobs downtown. They gave them the civil service jobs downtown. This is what they did to improve their relationship with Southern European immigrants who they treated like Negroes. This is what American America did to improve its relationship with Southern European immigrants who they treated almost as bad, not as bad, okay? But as close as possible, they treated them as poorly as they had treated us because no one's been treated as bad as black folk. So now, America creates the Federal Housing Authority. America creates the Federal Housing Authority. And now poor white trash can get low interest loans and grants from the government to move out the ghetto. Now poor white trash can get low interest loans to move out of the ghetto because now black people are moving into the ghettos in the night between 1920 and 1940 between the two world wars and white people are like how are you gonna let these negroes come and live with us so america said we're going to help you get out the ghetto by creating the federal housing authority and create and creating welfare programs to get white folks out of the inner city and move them into okay the suburbs now, when black people were living with white people, the crime went from white on white crime to white on black crime. I want y'all to stay with me. Stay with me. It evolved. First, it was white on white ethnic crime. Jews killing Jews. Italians killing Italians. Irish killing Italians. I, I, you see, it was the Irish versus the Italians, the Italians versus the Jews, the Jews versus the Irish. And then it was inter-ethnic crime, Irish on Irish, Italian on Italian, Jew on Jew. The whites were fighting each other. And then when we moved into the inner city, they start beating us up. They started lynching us. They started killing us, okay? So it went from white on white crime to white on black crime. They don't never talk about that. Why they never talk about how the white people kill black people in the inner cities? Why they never talk about how the Irish used to hang black folks in the inner cities in the 20s and in the 30s and in the 40s and in the 50s? Why you don't talk about how the Jews used to hang black people and beat us up and how many of our grandparents couldn't even come home from school the direct way they had to go all the way around to, in order to get home so they didn't get beat up by Jewish gangs and get beat up by Irish gangs and get beat up by Italian gangs. They never talk about the white on black crime. Once the whites evacuated the inner city with the help of the black community, then black on black crime began. But black on black crime began doesn't really kick in until the 60s. Black on black crime doesn't really kick in until the 60s. And the reason a black on black crime doesn't really kick in until the 60s is because we had jobs. We had jobs. We had jobs. It wasn't until 1968 when the United States government assassinated Dr. King. They went into the inner city and de-industrialized the inner city. They shut down the factories that used to employ black men. And then they went into the inner cities and they shut down the industrial building trade programs that used to train young black men in livable wage skill jobs that they could go and use to earn employment and start their own business. We were plumbers. We were electricians. We were carpenters. 
We were barbers, we were woodworkers, we were stone masons, we were auto mechanics, we were auto body repairs, we were welders, okay, we were seamen. I mean, black men, we had over 50 different trades that we were able to use to feed our family, that we were able to use to take care of our community. There was no gang banging yet. We did not start gang banging until we lost our damn jobs. We did not start gang banging until we lost our damn jobs. Black men didn't have time to be in no gang. Black men didn't have time to do no damn gang banging. We didn't start gang banging until we got laid off of the jobs and now we angry and we mad and we resentful and we're not able to exercise any power or authority over our reality. We weren't able to exercise any power or authority over our reality, so we started building gangs. We started making gangs because we were mad. Somebody had to pay for the fact that we couldn't take care of our families. Somebody had to pay for the fact that we couldn't find jobs. Somebody had to pay for the fact that we couldn't put a roof over the heads of our wives and children. So the gangs began to evolve as a reaction to the economic castration of the black man by the United States government. I'm gonna say it again. The gangs in the black community evolved as an economic reaction to white America's financial castration of the black male. There would be no damn gangs if they didn't start castrating black males because when we had jobs we didn't have time for no damn gangs the only person who can really be a part of a gang is an unemployed black male the only person who's even interested in being part of a gang is an unemployed now check this out check this out I'm gonna take it a step further gang the primary job of a gang the primary function of a gang, and I know a lot of brothers who belong to gangs, and not all gangs are bad, and some gangs actually do good, and a lot of gangs in the recent decades have begun to evolve their focus and their purpose. And we even know that some gangs were actually the offshoots of revolutionary-based organizations that were destroyed by the FBI and then ultimately infiltrated by the FBI into reactionary gang elements. So many of these gangs even had a positive origin, a positive catalyst. But here's what I want you guys to understand. The primary function of the gang is not violence. Do you know what the primary function of a gang is? And this is facts. And this is facts. The primary function of a gang is to help their members find employment legal or illegal what gang do you know does not operate some sort of an economic enterprise even even if it is illegal the purpose of a the gang is a union the gang is a labor union whether we're going to sell drugs whether we're going to run numbers whether we're going to steal cars whether we're going to hustle credit cards the purpose of a gang is to help black men find employment and sometimes the only employment that the gang can help the brothers find is illegal employment so from a certain perspective from a certain perspective, the United States government is responsible for black gangs having ever been created because if you never created the economic destitution, if you never created the economic destitution that is gripping the black community, there would have never been a need for gangs. Facts. 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 So, what we need to do, Baltimore City, I love you. Please don't ask Donald Trump to come in and save your black on black crime problem. Chicago, Illinois, I love you. Please don't ask Donald Trump to come in and solve your black on black crime problem. If you force Donald Trump to bring in the National Guard, if you force Donald Trump to hire more police, if you force Donald Trump to bring in the army, I'm telling you, the only thing that's going to happen, we're going to have more Trayvon Martins. We're going to have more Freddie Grays. We're going to have more Michael Browns. We're going to have more Sandra Blands. We're going to have more Tamir Rices. 
We're going to have more Amadou Diallos. We're going to have more Philando Castiles. We're going to have more Alting Sterlings. The only thing that's going to happen if y'all keep on begging Donald Trump to solve a black on black problem is you're going to get more police extermination of black people. That's the only thing. White people don't like you. White people don't care about you. Why are you asking them to come in and solve your problem? But let me tell you what you can ask the president to do. Let me tell you what you can ask the president to do. You can ask the president to put the industrial building trade programs back in the high schools. You can ask the president to hire black men as teachers. You can ask the president to put some factories in the black community so our black men can go back to work again. You can ask the president to get rid of these racist white police and hire black men in their place. You can ask the president to open up the recreation centers and the community centers and offer our children more programs than just basketball and football. Do you understand me? You can ask the president to eliminate the FHA in scattered site in Section 8 requirements that women cannot allow men in their homes if they have felony records. That's what you can ask the president to do. You can ask the president to give the black community an economic stimulus package in the form of jobs, just like Barack Obama, just like Barack Obama, just like Barack Obama gave Wall Street an economic stimulus package, okay, and bailed them out. If Barack Hussein Obama, if Barack Hussein Obama can bail out Wall Street with a billion dollar economic stimulus plan, why in the hell can't President Trump bail out the black community with a billion dollar economic stimulus plan? You don't ask the people who created the violence to solve the violence. You don't ask the people who created the violence to solve the damn violence. Listen, the mother of all violence is miseducation. The father of all violence is economic castration. The mother of all violence is miseducation. The father of all violence is e economic castration. You don't give me a decent education and then you take from me any opportunity to earn bread and butter for my family, I have no choice but to break the law. And I'm going to kill, and I'm going to steal, and I'm going to do whatever I have to do because deep down inside, I believe, I believe that if this country cared about me, I believe if my community cared about me, they would have looked out for me and they would have done something. They would have put some sort of program together to give me an opportunity to earn a decent living. Violence cannot be separated from the economic climate. Half the black men in America are unemployed. Half the black in Baltimore, in Baltimore City, 75 percent of black men are unemployed. In Chicago, Illinois, over 65% of black men are unemployed. Why aren't we talking about jobs? Why aren't we talking about industry? Why aren't we talking about employment? Why aren't we talking about skill programs? Why aren't we talking about the white racist labor unions in every city, the white racist labor unions in every city who systematically keep the percentage of black men who get trained to be skilled laborers at a minimal low and then they hire white boys in maximum numbers with black people's tax dollars. Something has to be said about the racism in America's labor unions with which the United States government is complicit by not making these white racist labor unions. Let's look at the electrical union in Chicago. Let's look at the plumbing union in Baltimore. Let's look at the carpentry union in Chicago. Let's look at the Siemens uh, union in Baltimore. How many black men are they hiring with our tax money? How many black women are they hiring with our tax money? When are we going to talk about the white racist labor unions who are not training and hiring black men, even though the government keeps on giving them contracts? Don't keep pointing the finger at my brothers. Don't keep pointing the finger at my brothers. We don't need no more damn cops. Have y'all done your research, Baltimore? Have you done your research, Chicago? What is the relationship between an influx of police and a reduction of violence? What is the relationship between an influx of police and a reduction of violence? And guess what the relationship is? It is a zero. 
it is a zero. Hiring police does not reduce violence. Hiring police does not reduce violence. Hiring police does not reduce violence. The only thing that hiring police does is give more white people jobs. The only thing that hiring police does is give white people jobs to move into Chicago and move into Baltimore and move into all of our other city centers, city centers and buy up the black houses from black homeowners and help the banks raise up the property rate and push black people out of their own damn city. Isn't it interesting that most of the police in black communities are white, even when the black community is predominantly black? Isn't it interesting that most of the police in the black community are white, even when that community is predominantly black? And you got unemployed black men with college degrees, unemployed black men with college degrees, no prison record, who would who would have no problem becoming a police officer in their in their own neighborhood. Millions of black men unemployed, college degrees, no prison record, who would love an opportunity to police and protect their own neighborhood. Why in the hell aren't you giving them jobs? Okay? 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 Don't tell Trump to deal with the violence. Tell Trump to deal with the causes. Causes. My great ancestor, Frederick Douglass, said, we keep on striking at branches. Rarely do we strike at the root of problems. The Honorable Frederick Augustus Washington Bailey said, we keep on striking at the branches of problems. When do we strike at the root? Strike at the root. Don't tell him to come in and stop violence. Tell him to come in and address the causes. The causes of this violence. And I know y'all don't want me to say this because today is Sunday. I know y'all don't want me to say this because today is Sunday and it's Father's Day. And right now, black churches all across America are celebrating black fathers. And to that, I say to the pastor, to the bishop, to the preacher, and to the clergy, with all due respect, on this Sunday, you all are full of shit. Forgive my language, but you're full of shit. You ain't got nothing to do with Jesus. How in the hell you collect $14 million every Sunday? How in the hell does the black church collect $14 million every Sunday and you ain't putting no black men to work and you got the nerve to talk about you having a Father's Day celebration at church, you having a Father's Day breakfast at church, you having a Father's Day lunch at church, you having a Father's Day dinner at church. We want to celebrate all the fathers. We want all the fathers to come to church on Father's Day Sunday. You full of shit. How many of of you giving out jobs to those unemployed black fathers in church today? How many of you pastors and bishops and trustees in clergy? How many of you are helping the fathers who came out to the Father's Day service today? How many of you are helping them get jobs? You're full of shit. You're full of shit. How dare you in the name of Jesus Christ? How dare you in the name of the black Christ of Ethiopia have a sermon where you want to honor fathers, but you not doing nothing to help those fathers be better fathers. You want to be a, you want to help a black man be a better man? Give him a damn job. You want to help a black daddy become a better daddy? Give him a damn job. You passed as a bunch of con artists. And then you're going to ask them to dig in a pocket and make a donation. And then you're going to ask them to dig in a pocket and make a donation. Damn that. Damn that. Every penny collected on today's 2017 Black Father's Day by the black church needs to go to those black fathers so they can pay their rent. It needs to go to that black fathers so they can put food on, the, on, on, on their children's table. It needs to go to them black fathers so they can put clothes on their baby's back so they can pay for graduation and prom night. If you really care about black fathers, I'm talking to the black pastors and I know everybody not guilty. I know everybody not guilty. I respect that. I'm a descendant of preachers. I speak in churches all the time. I respect that. But most of you, especially you medium size in mega churches, you medium size in mega churches. 
You have hundred thousand dollar budgets. Some of you got million dollar budgets and you got the audacity to have a Father's Day celebration and you ain't giving out no damn jobs. And you ain't giving out no damn jobs. I can't respect that. I can't respect that. I can't respect that. Black fathers should march into the black church and demand a damn job. Black fathers should march into the black church today and demand a damn job. You want to celebrate me? Celebrate me with a damn paycheck. Celebrate me with a job application. That's how you celebrate me. And if the black church don't want to give out no jobs, give out some small business grants. You mean to tell me the black church can't give out a couple $5,000 business grants? You can have a, a business plan competition for black fathers. You can have a business plan competition for black fathers. You can have a business plan competition for black fathers. And I'm not talking about no one award. Give out 25 $5,000 small business grants. Give out $25, $5,000 small business grants to black fathers on this 2017 Black Fathers Day. We celebrated Juneteenth yesterday, Father's Day today. I'm tired of the nonsense. The black church got to put up or shut up. The black church got to put up or shut up. And I'm talking to my Akis. I'm talking to my Akis too. Some of the mass jids get a lot of money. Let's keep it 100. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Some of these masjids is getting a lot of money. Some of these masjids, some of you Sunni Muslims, you getting a lot of money in those masjids, but you ain't putting no brother to work. You got him fasting during Ramadan, okay? Ramadan Mubarak. Nothing wrong with that. You want the brother to build his spiritual strength. You want the brother to dedicate his life to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I can respect all that, brother. I can respect all that Aki, but where the damn jobs at? Where the damn jobs at? Don't just tell them to put on a kufi and come make Fadja. Don't just tell them to put on a kufi and come make Maghrib and Zor and Asa. Don't just tell them to put on a kufi and come pray. Get that man a damn job. Give that man a damn job. You driving around with your long beard and your uh and your long uh Jalabia on and you got your kufi on and your Mercedes Benz. You got your Yukon with the rims on it. Aki. Aki. You ain't nothing but a bougie-ass Muslim. A bougie-ass Muslim. We got bougie-ass Muslims and we got bougie-ass Christians. All y'all guilty. All y'all guilty. Get these black men a job. Brothers and sisters, this is the Prince of Pan-Africanism. I got a lunch date with a couple sisters. We're going to be talking some business and politics here. Seattle, Washington, stand up. Breakfast Club, I'll see y'all Wednesday. Charlemagne, Envy, and Angie. Washington, D.C., Power Talk, Saturday. Washington, D.C., Overflow. Can't wait to see y'all. I got to find out what time I'm speaking. Somebody get a hold of Carl Nelson. Okay, WOLDCnews.com. Find out what time the Prince is coming on stage. Okay. I'm going to have some books there, some T-shirts there. Brooklyn, June 30th. Like I said, if I got anything going on in your city from July 1st to July 27th when we leave for Africa, please text me, Dr. Umar. We got a nice event coming up. You might want to come. Let me know. Dr. Umar, we having a big black family cookout. Let me know. You feel me? I want to have fun. Can I enjoy myself for a little bit? Because I'm out here fighting for these kids. And I don't need no pat on the back, but I'm out here keeping these kids out of special ed. I'm out here empowering black mothers and fathers. I'm out here helping the grandparents. You understand? I'm out here keeping them out of jail. I'm stopping suicides and homicides and gang banging. That's what I'm out here doing. I'm putting the work in. I ain't just whole tepping on YouTube. I'm putting the work in. I ain't just Facebook live in. I'm putting the work in. You understand me? Like I tell all my detractors, if you can find another black man who does more for black children in this country as it relates to education and mental health, you need to call their name. I need to hear their damn name. I need to hear their damn name. If someone has done more to save our children and especially our boys in the past 20 years, give me their damn name. Because ain't nobody put in more work when it comes to saving black boys in America than Dr. Umar Johnson. I don't give a damn who you is. I don't give a damn who you is. Okay? That's how we coming. And we will have the Tuesday morning black parent teleconference Tuesday. I'm sorry. I missed the last couple of weeks. I've been tired flying around China, Japan, Tokyo, Nagoya, Beijing, Shanghai. My apologies. But black parents, we back on track.
Tuesday morning, 6 a.m. to 8 a.m., the Black Parent Teleconference. Any questions about your children, education, and mental health, you can call 857-232-0158, 857-232-0158, 857-232-0158. Access code is 870-864-POUND, 870-864-POUND, 870-864-POUND. Donate. GoFundMe.com slash Dr. Umar. GoFundMe.com slash Dr. Umar or mail your Chuck and Money order payable to FDMG Academy, P.O. Box 6872, Philadelphia 19132. I'm still looking for schools. I'm still looking for schools. We ain't done yet. 82118. I'm serious. 82118. I'm serious. Let's get this school family. Let's get this school. I got to go to South Carolina for a couple schools. Detroit. I got to go see three more schools. I didn't get a chance because I was so tired the morning I flew out of Detroit from Minneapolis. Okay? Let's get this school. I wanted Baltimore. I was looking for Baltimore. Chicago. I got to go back to Chicago for a couple schools. You know what I mean? Chicago, we still got a chance. Detroit, we still got a chance. I can't find nothing in Baltimore. You know, Virginia, Carolinas, let me know what you see. And we want to see everybody at the next Raleigh, Durham, North Carolina National Independent Black Parent Association Conference. We want to see everybody at the next National Independent Black Parent Association training. Durham, North Carolina. Mark your calendar. September 14th and 15th. Brother Manny, who is our Durham chapter president, and his queen are going to be hosting. And Sister Ashley, who has a study group in Durham, she's going to be working with them. So that's about to hit out. That's about to be popping. So make sure you are there. Okay. All right, family. Prince of Pan Africanism.